This is going to be an animated book review of the book Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction, written by Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. Now, Super Forecasting is predicting things in the future that are very relevant. There's an annual budget of $50 billion spent on forecasting, whether that be stuff like the weather, or is there going to be a huge war outbreak in the next 15 years? And this book kind of goes into that and explains how people actually predict that. First, I want you to leave a comment below at where you think this channel will be in one year. How many subscribers will it have and how many views total will it have? Leave a comment below. The first concept I'd like to go over has to do with Enrico Fermi. Now, Enrico Fermi was the guy who estimated the strength of an atomic bomb simply by measuring how far the pieces of paper he dropped flew after the blast. This was an amazing experiment. But the principle goes like this. If we know every known particle in the universe, where it is right now and what its motion is, then we can perfectly predict the future, which is basically saying the more we know about now, the better we can predict the future. Another concept I'd like to go over is that forecast generally are general. The CEO of Microsoft said, there's no chance the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. Now notice he said significant. What does that mean? Does that mean above 50%, above 20%, above 85%? What's significant? And he also says market share. He doesn't clarify if it's the United States market share, if it's the market share of phones. He just says that the iPhone is not going to get any significant market share. He's not very clear in his forecasting. Now, as we know, he was proven wrong. So that's the second principle I'd like to get into, is that when you forecast, try to be as specific as possible. And the third concept I got out of this book is that when you are making predictions, try to break down stuff into smaller questions. Enrico Fermi also asked his students if they could figure out how many piano tuners there are in Chicago. And the authors of this book say, if you broke it down into four simple questions, you could figure this out pretty easily. If you broke it down into the number of pianos in Chicago, how often pianos are tuned per year, how long it takes to tune a piano, and how many hours a year the average piano tuner works. If you know the answer to these four questions, you can pretty well predict that there's going to be 63 piano tuners in Chicago. So that's the big concept number three I got out of this book, is to break down large questions into smaller questions. The fourth thing has to do with probability. Now there was this teacher and he gave his students two kinds of homework. He split the class into two and he said, all right, the first half, I want you to flip a coin, heads or tails, and write it down and do this 200 times. And the second group, he said, okay, I don't want you to flip the coin, I just want you to write down a random heads or tails pattern. So after the students did this, they turned in their papers, and the teacher said, all right, I can grade these papers, and I can split them into the piles of who actually flipped the heads or tails and who didn't. And he did this because our brains are wired. We say, hey, you know, there should probably be a pretty even chance that there's not going to be any more than three heads or three tails in a row, but the chances for getting at least three, at least four, even at least five heads or tails in a row, if you flip a coin 200 times, are enormous. So he went through the patterns, and he realized if there weren't any groups of five heads or five tails in a row, that these were the students that cheated and did not actually flip their coins. And this book goes into the probability factor a little bit more. I have a book in mind that I'm going to do on probability, so I don't want to go into it too in depth. The fifth thing that I got out of this was the knowledge curve. They said that someone who has an IQ of 170 is just a little bit greater at predicting than someone who reads the New York Times. IQ doesn't add that much to how well you can predict. It has to do with how much information you can receive. The knowledge curve is saying, hey, with a whole bunch more knowledge, we're only going to get a little bit more better at predicting. And even then, there's going to be some factors. Like, what if a black hole just randomly sucks up the universe? There's going to be stuff that we cannot predict. The authors came up with a list of qualities that make a great super forecaster. Some of these include being cautious and humble. You have to understand that nothing is certain and reality is infinitely complex that's part of being humble the best super forecasters are also actively open-minded they completely understand that beliefs are hypotheses to be tested and not treasures to be protected they are also comfortable with numbers and self-critical they are also really careful about the anchoring bias and are thoughtful updaters which means that when facts change they also change their minds and my personal two favorite is that they have a growth mindset they believe that it's possible to get better and they have grit which means they are determined to keep at it however long it takes. For some forecasts, it takes up to 50 years to see the consequences. This is where grit comes in. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video and I hope you learned something. If you have any book recommendations, leave a comment below of that book and if I pick the book and I eventually do an animated book review of it, I will send you the book for free. If your comment was the one that inspired me to make the book review. You may enjoy my animated book review on the happiness advantage and on learned optimism. Also, click the like button below if you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.